Good morning. Uh, my name is Jordan Schillinger. On behalf of the team here at Oliver Van Dyke Insurance, we want to warmly welcome you to our 2021 Transportation Summit. Uh, we are preparing for this this morning, and we're all over virtual meetings, and we hope that next year we'll be able to have this in person. Uh, but we do appreciate you tying in uh, for a virtual summit this morning. Now, as always, we have some exceptional speakers and great content lined up for our uh, transportation partners. Uh, we'll introduce our speakers, and then we'll take care of a few housekeeping items, and then we'll get on with the presentation. So. Uh, a few things, uh, there is a Q&A feature that'll be at the lower right-hand corner that you can submit questions uh, to the panelists and we'll answer those either throughout the presentation or we'll answer those at the end uh, with a Q&A session. And then this is a, a recorded event, so keep that in mind. If you would like to share this with other members of your team after the summit is complete, uh, shoot me a note or shoot uh, one of the members at OVD a note and we'll get that over to you. So we're gonna introduce our speakers. Our first is Josh Stahl from National Interstate. Uh, he's been with National Interstate for 13 years, specializing in transportation insurance and focuses on alternative risk programs, uh, captives, hybrid captives, and things of that nature. And he works with motor carriers across the United States, looking for those best in class motor carriers, and then works along with OVD to educate the clients on different risk management te techniques and how they can reduce their overall cost of risk. And we have Katie Pachorek as well from National Interstate, and Katie specializes in risk management programs and managing as far as technology, telematics, and things of that nature to really help motor carriers operate as efficiently and as safely as possible. In her role, she focuses on developing and managing uh, customer solutions focused on loss prevention and mitigation, specifically, as we mentioned before, uh, workers' compensation, technology, and telematics. And then finally, we have Matt Fabry from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And Matt has been with the FMCSA since 2004 and in his current role as the federal program specialist since 2011. And in that role, uh, he oversees the safety investigators and then kind of ties that in with the Michigan State Police Motor Carrier Division. So we're certainly happy that all three of them have taken some time from their schedule to visit with us. Uh, this morning, Matt will be talking about some regulatory updates from the DOT and what to expect from Washington over the next year. Uh, but before we get into that, Josh and Katie are going to spend a lot of time talking about all the data that's available for motor carriers and how we can utilize that as an asset for recruiting, retention, training, and things of that nature. So we're thrilled that we have these partners uh, of OVD uh, with us this morning, and we'll now turn it over to Ben, who has a few housekeeping items, and then we'll get started with Josh and Kate. Perfect. Thanks, Jordan. Um, today, we're going to have the chat disabled, but we want you to submit your questions uh, through the Q&A. So um, on your, if you're connected through the application, um, in the bottom right-hand corner, there are some three little dots at the far right next to participants in chat. Um, you'll see Q&A there. Join through your web browser. You will see a little box with a question mark in it um, where you can submit your Q&A questions. And if you're on your mobile app, you will see it um, in the top left-hand corner. Um, we want you to choose from the drop-down menu all panelists when you submit your questions. Um, if you accidentally send it to one of us, um, we, we can reassign it to. So you will. Um, everyone's going to be on mute, um, but we will be able to answer your questions through the chat. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Jordan. Thanks. We're going to pass it right into Josh. Oh, thanks. sorry about that, Josh. No, that's all right. That's perfect. I, I appreciate the introductions. We're, we're happy to be here today. Kate and I uh, obviously very passionate about the trucking industry. Uh, as, as Jordan mentioned, I've been uh, in the trucking uh, space for 13 years now here at National Interstate uh, on the underwriting side, the product management side, and, and work with a number of our captive programs uh, here, um, over 150 customers across the United States. Uh, and Kate is really our expert when all it comes to all things, uh, really technology um, and and safety and risk management. So uh, we're excited to share with you um, just our thoughts on some of the data that's available uh, for you within your trucking fleets through the use of technology and what you can do with that to really uh, drive a safety culture, uh, a data driven safety culture, and how it ultimately could help you reduce. Um, your costs, um, cost of risk, cost of retention, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I know many of you probably grew up in this industry. Um, if, if you're new to it, um, you certainly understand that um, the data that's available today 
is far greater than the data that was available, say, even 10 or 15 years ago. And you think back 10 or 15 years, what could you get from the truck? Uh, you knew the fuel economy after you completed the route. Uh, you know how much fuel you burned uh, and how far you went. Uh, you knew the route um, after the fact. Uh, you didn't know necessarily the temperature, the weather, uh, the traffic, the, the speed throughout the entire uh, route. It was all after uh, you completed that. So the, the data back then was, was really, it, it was descriptive. What happened? Um, you learned about everything after it was complete. Today, with telematics, with automated event recorders, you know the location of your truck, you know the weather, the traffic, the speed, whether there was a harsh braking event, a hard cornering event, um, you know that, you know, depending on the linkages that you have, sometimes you know the speed of the traffic around you, the temperature of your reefer unit, the oil life, the fuel economy, the tire pressure, um, so there's a lot of data that can be gleaned. In fact, some organizations uh, go so far as to know their driver's vitals uh, through the use of wearable technology. I mean, everybody has a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, um, a, a Whoop nowadays that you can really, um, you know, get a lot of information about a driver too with that, you know, blood oxygen levels, heart rates, all that good stuff uh, through the use of wearable technology. The point is, is that there is a massive uh, amount of data that's available to you being produced by your trucks and drivers on a daily basis. And it, so much so that, you know, it can seem daunting. Um, we hear all the time and, and we struggle with it too. There's so much data, it can be difficult to marry it all together, make it actionable, make it valuable for your operation. So we hear, you know, people say we get we have information overload. We've got paralysis by analysis, and certainly there are integration challenges trying to make it all fit um, one source of data with another. And you know, a recent study uh, this came out of CCJ um, a couple months back, but uh, it's estimated that within trucking, within transportation fleets, uh, somewhere between sixty and seventy three percent of the data that they get goes unused uh, for analytics. And, you know, I, I, Kate and my point today is that's, that's really okay. Uh, a little bit can go a long way if you're using it in a proactive manner. Um, and, you know, I, I had mentioned some of the data that was available prior to is really descriptive. What, what happened? And what we're trying to do with data and sort of as everything becomes the, the internet of things, um, moving from that descriptive, what happened, to a diagnostic, why did it happen, to predictive, what will happen, and then ultimately prescriptive, what should we do to prevent it? Um, you know, and, and that prescriptive insight is really going to help drive or can help drive your organization in a couple of different ways. For us, we feel like it, you can really enhance your risk management practices. Um, it gives you the ability to um, focus on uh, specific um, things that you have set in place, practices that you have in place. Um, it, it gives you the ability to really hone in on training for drivers, and we're gonna circle back to that today. Um, it gives you some operational efficiencies so, you know, you think about you've got a truck in for preventative maintenance and 2,000 miles later, something else goes out in the truck and you're recording that data and you're finding that that's happening more and more often. Well, rather than bringing the truck back in after you, you know that that's going to happen, you do it with preventative maintenance, um, saving you time, saving you some operational efficiency there as well. Targeted training. Um, you know, this one is a big one. This, the data that you get from um, 
either your telematic systems, your automated event recorders can help you focus specifically on what a driver uh, needs. Um, it also gives you the ability to recognize drivers when they do a great job. Um, and, and that's a big, a, a big push that, that we think is, is gonna have a big uh, impact on the industry. And then ultimately, how can that data help you control and or improve your bottom line? How can we make it actionable to help you reduce your costs? Training, recruiting, retention, um, cost of risk, and that's a big one, and we're gonna circle back to that today as well. So with that sort of as the backdrop here, I'm gonna hand it over to Kate to really kind of talk through uh, two of the technologies that, one that we have been big proponents of for years and years and years now, uh, and one that's, that's somewhat new to us, and we're, we're working through it and learning um, alongside our insurers as we help to try to make some of this data actionable. Thank you, Josh. Uh, you know, as Josh mentioned and Jordan this morning, we're heavily focused on what you can do with the data. So shifting towards some specific solutions that we're gonna talk about that we have a lot of experience with, and I think a lot of you have experience with as well, are telematics devices and video technology and vehicle automated, automated event recorder solutions, AERs as we call them. Um, but specifically focusing for this next portion on those pieces of technology that are in your vehicle uh, and how to leverage that data, whether it's through the video, whether it's through the telematics, uh, device information, vehicle diagnostics, improving your claims reporting process and managing those outcomes. Uh, we really, again, have a lot of ex experience with these pieces of technology, so we're really gonna focus here in the next section um, on navigating how to leverage that data. So where do you spend this time on, where do you spend your time? I love this slide because today's technology has advanced so much further than where we started um, and gives you some really detailed reports that you can immediately take action on with information that you didn't have before. So um, the older systems, you really spend a lot more of your time evaluating your videos and probably being a little bit more reactive with them because you didn't have that much time to dig through the videos and make actionable decisions. It was really about, we've had hundreds of triggered events over the last days and weeks. Is there anything we need to do with this information? Use it as backup, we have it as a crash recorder. Uh, really difficult to manage your time in order to be proactive with it. So today's systems do so much more and really generate a lot of reporting and actually tie safety scores to your individual drivers and their trips. So instead of a safety director or a manager, HR manager, uh, spending time reviewing video footage, when you log in for the day or if you're getting alerts on your phone, you're actually just seeing a driver profile, a trip profile that's giving you insight as to who you need to talk to and why. So it's aggregating these scores of the number of speeding infractions or the number of hard braking events over a period of time, miles driven, hours driven, um, maybe some artificial intelligence. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a future slide, but it gives you that immediate profile picture of the driver and their driving history in, in order to give you that moment of time that you probably don't already have um, to address the right things with your drivers and save time and make sure you're spending time on the right things. Um, what we'd love to highlight in this slide as well, in this specific system refers to uh, positive driver actions as driver stars, but other systems call it other things. They're all working to also acknowledge positive driver behaviors because a critical part to this, you know, technology in your vehicles working is making sure you do have driver engagement. There can be a lot of fear, especially in the trucking industry and privacy concerns and getting past that is critical and keeping drivers aware that this is a tool for them. Um, so a lot of these systems, again, acknowledge positive driving behaviors and they attribute that and calculate that within the safety score. So you can also have the opportunity to say, oh, I need to you know, coach driver A, but I also wanna use this opportunity to acknowledge the positive driving behavior uh, you know, of Bob because he did a great job at this. Uh, a great example we've seen recently is improving following distance. So you know, say your driver is maintaining great following distance, another driver enters the highway or they cut over a lane, 
uh, really, you know, taking away that space cushion that your driver had before, and then your driver pulls back to maintain following distance. This is great defensive driving. It's a great behavior we like to see because rear end collisions are always on the rise. Um, it's something you want to acknowledge and continue to promote across the fleet. So it's just one of those positive behaviors uh, identified amongst these systems, giving you the opportunity to acknowledge it with your driver and also factor into their overall performance as a driver for your company. So evolution of video technology, again, I don't know how long some of you, if you've had cameras in your trucks for a long time at National Nurse State, we started our program 15 years ago. And I can tell you that the older systems, the DC1s, the DC2s, that a lot of us were familiar with were older, bulkier systems that were really expensive. In most cases, you had to have a wireless network installed at each terminal where your drivers were gonna be returning at you know, 5,000 a pop. You generally needed some internal IT resources to manage this information because it was clunky and it could fail often. Um, and so while it gave you more of a VHS style tape recording to again, go through triggered videos, uh, days or weeks, you know, once your driver came back to the terminal because they did typically have to come back to the terminal in order to review that information. Uh, you weren't really able to be very impactful with it. You, you know, again, it takes a lot of time to go through that information. If somebody had a hard breaking event a week ago, are you going to sit down and have an effective training coaching session with them a week later? Probably not. And what happened between then and now? So while there was a lot of information there, it generally was used as a reactive crash recorder. Uh, you know, did somebody call and complain about our driver or did we have an accident? When you get back to the terminal, we can pull that video footage. And even then with that limited amount of information, uh, it was still very valuable, valuable, right? Con folks continue to install the technology. It still had a big impact on how we were able to defend claims and save money. Um, but thankfully, we've seen a big progression over time and a lot of advancement in technology. And today it's, you know, not, you don't have to have the infrastructure at your location. It's live streaming and cloud storage and immediate feedback. So when a driver has a heartbreaking event, um, you know, that that's going to get triggered right away. So you have the opportunity same day or, you know, within a couple of hours when they take their break to talk to that driver and better understand, you know, maybe the heartbreaking event was simply because of traffic slowing. Um, maybe they could have had better following distance, but maybe not. Maybe there's nothing to address, but it's having that heightened awareness and the ability to actually prevent possible collisions, not just have a crash recorder, you know, protection in the event of an accident, but you're actually able to be proactive now with the video technology, coach and train as needed. Again, you know, use positive driving behaviors to share with the rest of the fleet. Um, to improve safety across the board. So it's really moved quite a lot um, over the last couple of years. You know, I feel like it was a little bit consistent and stagnant for, you know, eight to 10 years. And now we've seen a lot of change over the last few years, which is great and is really beneficial. But to Josh's earlier point, there's a lot of data. So what do you do with it? And it can be a little bit overwhelming. Video versus vision. Um, this is really focused on the artificial intelligence that we're seeing today and how much it's changed the game for also preventing and controlling losses. So I just you know, referenced the big transition we saw from older style systems to being able to live stream and prevent in real time or near real time, have effective coaching sessions with your drivers or improve your training program. But the inclusion of artificial intelligence events has now made it real time. So it's not just reviewing a video that happened eight hours ago or yesterday. It's the live time identification of risk factors um, and an audible alert to your driver and a notification to you. So, you know, we're talking about, again, I, I go back to following distance a lot, but it's a big one. If your driver doesn't have proper following distance and that distance is decreasing for whatever reason and they're not applying the brakes, there's an audible alert to the driver or posted speed and stop rolling stop signs is a big one. We see a lot of triggers based on that. 
So previously, although very effective and added a lot of value, you needed a trigger to occur in order to see the videos and what's going on inside your vehicles. You needed that heartbreaking event or that speeding event in order to see the videos of what's happening. And maybe the driver was on their phone and distracted, but you wouldn't have known that without that triggered event. With artificial intelligence, we don't need an inertia triggered event. It doesn't have to be a G-force trigger. It's now recognized based on internal and external factors. So you might see uh, specific head and hand movement is going to trigger fatigue or cell phone usage as to where you know the driver never hit their brakes. They didn't have a hard swerving incident. It's simply that actual risk factor that triggered it based on the artificial intelligence sensors. Um, U-turns and positive actions, a lot of these are all being identified within artificial intelligence, further filling that gap, right? So as we continue to advance, we're getting a more complete picture of the actual driver um, experience and performance and can further prevent any collisions. To think, you know, to know that a driver could be on their phone and very distracted, or fatigued, you know, head bobbing. And if they weren't hard braking or speeding or swerving previously, you wouldn't have had that information. So it just continues to add to the whole picture of being able to prevent collisions and control your outcomes. Uh, so we conducted a study at National Interstate 2018, I believe that says, we're constantly looking for feedback from our customers as to the experience of implementing technology. We're always working with folks to try to implement it in the right way so you don't have that driver fear. We, of course, acknowledge that there's a driver shortage, and we want to work hand in hand with you to make sure that you don't have concerns, that you can implement technology the right way. Um, and don't lose drivers over it. So we were always looking for that feedback and conduct, therefore conducted this study. And an overwhelming, you know, 76% of customers that had implemented technology said that they felt it was an improvement to their driver's attitudes. And I think that's really important because we're not just talking about performance here. The performance is measured metrically within the platform. You can see in the dollars and cents and the numbers an improvement in a driver's performance after technology. But to say 76% felt that their drivers actually had an improved attitude after implementing the technology, I think goes a long way to showing that ultimately, once you get past that fear, drivers learn that this can be a tool for them and protection like they haven't had before on the road. So previously, they are guilty until proven innocent. Someone can call and complain and say, your driver cut me off, your driver did this. Uh, maybe they're involved in a, an accident or if they had mystery damage and they're coming back and trying to explain to you what happened and defend themselves. Uh, we see a lot of that too. So now they have, once they get past that fear and understanding, and if you're managing in the right way, and continuing to you know, highlight positive performance as well and use it as training and coaching, drivers do adapt to it and understand that it actually gives them more control than they previously had. So we're gonna look at a video here, um, just you know, demonstrating what the complete picture looks like because we do still see a lot of folks with, well, I just have the black box. We have data coming in that we can take action on. Why do I need the video? Or why do I need both the inside and outside video? So we like to, to take a look at this just to kind of demonstrate the value. Um, this video itself was, was an incident. So as you know, Josh is playing it, all you can see um, it's a little bit small, but is is a blip, right? You can see where there's a G-force trigger, a hard braking event, not really sure uh, exactly what happened other than this driver had a hard braking event. If we look at the next view, which is the, you know, outward facing only, We see the driver entering an intersection, the vehicle entering an intersection because we can't see the driver and approaching stop traffic that, you know, without applying the brakes fast enough. So they end up swerving over. Uh, you can also see as they finally come to a stop, thankfully missing everything in their path, 
uh, their school children in the intersection crossing. So you, you really understand the severity of what this could have been, uh, which is a great you know, level of added information, but we still don't know why the incident occurred. So now clearly, you know, we can see the driver was on his phone, uh, which is why he didn't apply the brakes when the other traffic had stopped and nearly entered the intersection. So without that in, you know, interior view, you have no understanding as to, you can make an assumption that the driver was distracted or the, and they can defend themselves and, um, you know, try to investigate further. But now you can see what led up to this. And furthermore, thankfully, it didn't lead to a rear end collision, pushing other vehicles into the intersection where there were students crossing. So giving you the opportunity and the further insight to talk to this driver. And I'm assuming this, you know, this might not have been their first near miss. I would imagine that was a scary moment for the driver. Um, and, you know, a great time for intervention to talk about cell phone use. Um, as much as we want to say we have zero policy against cell phone use and we have no handheld, I can tell you for those who haven't installed technology, it's going to be the first thing you see a lot of um, is no seatbelts and either a lot of cell phone use or even tablets. You know, it's out there. It's um, you want to have that awareness and have the ability to get in front of it before you have a collision and that data from their phone can be pulled to show that they were watching a video on YouTube when they rear ended somebody. So to continue down the path of, you know, talking about this data, what we can do with it, why does it have such an impact? Um, we've spoken a lot about video technology, right? Crash recorder to preventability and now live time vision um, to reducing collisions. And then we want to add in this telematics piece of it. So the telematics data, you know, it can come from a lot of different devices. When we talk about telematics, what we want is that engine data. What we want is the GPS tracking. Really, it's more the complete picture of a full trip history connecting the dots between those triggered events, whether they were G-force triggered events or artificial intelligence. That's more of a crumb trail of things that happened during a trip versus telematics is going to give you the full history. So again, we're, we're kind of rounding out and broadening the picture step by step as we introduce more technology and giving you that complete picture. Um, as to you know what your driver profiles look like. You might have a driver who you know is more unlucky than others and or you, or is more lucky, you know, depending on the videos that you're seeing. And there's a lot you can do that information. But really understanding the complete picture of what someone's driver profile looks like over a period of time is going to give you far more information as to you know how they're probably going to, to drive for you going forward. You know, it's data is you know, just like any numbers, the more you have, the more credible it is, the more that you can predict from it. So adding in that telematics data and really getting a broad picture of how somebody drives for you really gives you much more information to go on as to how that driver needs to be trained and how likely they are to drive for you in the future. Uh, so this information, I just like to highlight this because, again, as we've seen so much technology advancement, um, whether it's adding more bells and whistles to systems that are already out there or integration, it's becoming so much easier for you, for the company owner, to get access to this information and do it in an easier format. So you have ELD companies adding, you know, more detailed information to the reports they're delivering to you or camera companies adding more bells and whistles, improving the artificial intelligence factors that they can report on. Um, they're also adding more solutions to their systems. So you have companies like Samsara that add an ELD option to their camera system as well as fleet tracking. So you as a fleet owner can actually work off one single platform for the devices in your vehicle, or you have ELD companies adding camera solutions, similar concept. They're trying to broaden um, their offering to you to make it easier to have all of your information in one, one portal, which is great. We started to see that a few years ago, but what we're starting to see more of now 
is them being willing to share their data with one another or create strategic alliances with you know one company to one company and open that data up to competitors for the greater good of a fleet owner. So it used to be a fear of sharing data amongst them because that's their competitive advantage. That's their secret sauce. They don't wanna lose that. But as it becomes more and more apparent that a fleet owner owns that data and wants access to that data and wants it to work with their fleet tracking and their dispatch system, um, that they're allowing it and still finding ways to be competitive and make sure that they are going to be your service pro provider. So we're seeing just a great amount of integration, which is ultimately just going to continue to benefit you to be able to either integrate that data, uh, you know, through open data feeds at your own company, if you do have uh, great IT resources that are able to do that, or you leverage your insurance company, uh, you know, as Josh mentioned, um, we do have a platform where we're able to integrate data of multiple systems together for you to try to give you a better outcome. So it's just a great trend that we're seeing in the, the willingness to share data from different systems in order to benefit you as a fleet owner. Uh, it's just going to continue to improve and continue to give you more data to learn how to manage. <laughs> yeah, Kate, and if I can build on that, you know, I do think that, um, you know, you all listening into this call are, are the drivers behind that, um, you know, getting with your technology companies and saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm asking for your help in integrating with my dispatch system or my, my TMS system. Um, you know, those uh, fleets that continue to push their technology providers um, are the ones that are really helping to, to spur this on and, and help these integrations. So uh, if you're already doing that, great. If you're not doing that um, and you've got some technologies that you're trying to figure out how to marry up, you know, continue to push those providers uh, because that's where we're seeing uh, the success. And highlighting really the claims experience this is something obviously you guys are dealing with on a regular basis and can have a large impact in your day to day. Uh, as you're starting to collect all this information from different, different devices, think about the information you have to gather when you get a call from a driver and he's been in an accident and what you're trying to do after that. What information are you trying to collect to send to the insurance company? What are you trying to do with the driver? Are you trying to send someone on scene, trying to get a police report, trying to talk to them? Are they okay? Is there a tow involved? Um, there's a lot of moving pieces when you have an accident and technology can really give you all, a lot more of the information you need to act quickly. So having that driver name immediately, exact location of the incident, is it in an intersection? Is it a rural road? Is it a highway? Um, driver speed leading up to the incident, You know, profile of the day, what are the road conditions? What's the weather like? A lot of that stuff gets pulled in from these devices and you know, supplemented through other telematics sources to give you a complete picture. So not only is that beneficial to you when you're trying to pull together a lot of information and also take care of the accident that just happened, um, you can also have that information automatically shared with your insurance company. So aside from you now having it immediately to share with us, you can have it sent over. So it's directly in the hands of an adjuster so they can act immediately. And I know, you know, we, we talk a lot uh, from the insurance perspective and from the risk management perspective, um, the importance of reporting lag time. So how quick you can get that information to an adjuster and how much information you can get to them only improves how quickly and aggressively they can defend your claim and control that outcome. So it's really important. I mean, we have studies that we've looked at that really show how much dollar value of a claim increases when it's an older claim, you know, you didn't report it timely and we didn't get enough information. So all of this automation to feeding that claims detail really helps save you time when you're in kind of a critical position to manage an accident that just happened, but also just gives us that ability to jump on it immediately reduce that claims lag time and let us do what we do, which is jump all over that and try to, you know, control that outcome. You know, a lot of things happen and change in an accident scene, you know, whether it is the weather, whether it's witnesses, what they say they saw now versus five hours from now, um, you know, the driver's state of mind. So there's a lot that can change very quickly 
Um, and that's why, you know, it's the, the quicker we can get on it, the more we can control it and ultimately help control the cost of your claims. Awesome. So, you know, talking a lot about one of your biggest assets here, your data, uh, let's tie that into probably, if not your largest asset, you know, your second largest, if nothing else, but your drivers, I mean, they're, they're the ones that, that keep the company moving. Um, and how can this data really help you uh, train, retrain, uh, recruit, um, uh, retain the drivers? Um, and we really think that, again, as Kate mentioned a couple of times, these can be used to coach, but they can also be used to praise. And, and that's a big part of um, the benefit of being able to use this technology to impact your driver. So it really comes down to, to focus training. Uh, you know, are they uh, keeping good speed and space management? Have they given themselves an out? Um, are they using their cell phone? Are they following policies that you have in place uh, within your organization. If not, you have the opportunity right then and there to address it um, almost in real time. Uh, the fatigue and health awareness, and I think this is one that, that you know, is going to continue to expand as, as more and more people have the wearable devices. And, but even with some of the artificial intelligence, we have a, a driver uh, for one of our fleets that, um, you know, was actually on the verge of a major heart attack. Um, and as he's, he's driving, he, he kind of is, is blacking out and, and, and nodding off. And when they brought it to his attention, he had no real awareness that that was happening. So he went and got checked out, found out that he needed uh, triple bypass surgery. And, you know, ultimately, you know, he credits the artificial intelligence and the camera in his truck for saving his life and, you know, potentially saving a claim others lives uh, in, in the process as well. Um, so, you know, there, there's, with a lot of the, the artificial intelligence data, you're getting the head nods. So whether someone's dozing off or blacking out, um, you know, and that can be used to really help um, drive, you know, sleep apnea has been big, CPAP machines have been big and making sure that drivers are getting well rested. Uh, so this is a big piece here as well. Uh, and, and Kate mentioned this too, you know, it's protection for the driver. Um, these technologies can be used to exonerate drivers, have been used to exonerate drivers in thousands and thousands of cases. They are no longer uh, guilty until proven innocent. Um, we've got the facts and the information right there and there to say, no, our driver is, is in, in the right, doing everything that they should. And we also think that, you know, a lot of the data uh, can be used to uh, help with routing. You know, if you've got construction zones that you're constantly going through, or you've got uh, big cities, what time of day can should you go, th go through that? Um, and if you have to go at a certain time, what's the risk charge that you should uh, make to the shipper? Um, because you know that there's more uh, propensity for risk and for, for uh, a claim. So really fleet optimization, route optimization, um, you can avoid those risky routes or eliminate them altogether. Um, if you're, you know, and that's part of sharing your data with um, other folks so that that data becomes more and more and more um, useful because we've got more and more to analyze. And then ultimately, you know, improved routing, improved coaching um, leads to better job satisfaction. And um, I got a slide here coming up, but we're going to talk about a little more about the drivers. And um, they are professionals. Uh, they're the ones that are highly trained out there on the road with, you know, people like us who, uh, you know, drive to and from work every day. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, th there's a, a difference in, in what their focus is uh, versus somebody else's out on the road. And then one thing that we touched on that I think, uh, again, will have a, a big impact is the gamification. Um, people inherently don't like to lose. Uh, they they want to win. Um, and when you provide feedback, direct feedback to a pool of drivers, 
someone's at the top and someone's at the bottom. Well, guess what? Someone at the bottom of that list does not want to be at the bottom of the list for very long. They want to continue to work their way up. In addition to that, it gives you as an operation, as a fleet manager, to really focus on the folks that you need to focus on. Get your, you know, move, it's not even necessarily moving the bottom to the top. It's maybe moving the middle up, uh, moving the bottom to the middle. As long as they're continuing to improve and, and getting that um, feedback and you're sort of gamifying their driver experience for them, uh, that can have a big, big impact uh, on the drivers as well. So just to, you know, this is kind of a little tongue in cheek here, a little pool, but, um, you know, do you see the similarity here between uh, our driver and LeBron James, um, four-time MVP, six-time uh, NBA Finals champ, uh, we're, we're Cleveland, so we're, this is a little homer here, you know, LeBron brought a championship, uh, ended our drought, so we got to put LeBron up there, but um, these two, as I mentioned earlier, are both professionals. They're both highly trained, highly skilled in what they do. And the more and more that we um, put that persona out there, put that image out there, that the driver is the professional. And guess what? Professionals want to be coached. LeBron James has a shooting coach. Tom Brady has a strength and conditioning coach. The best of the best want to be coached and they want to continue to win. <clears throat> and just like a professional athlete, drivers can also find ways to win. They can, um, you know, win the speed and space battle. They can win their pre-check. They can win, um, you know, by, by arriving at their destination on time safely. So there are ways that you can coach and train and again, make it a little bit of a game um, where, you know, the, again, the, the professional persona that comes with being a driver um, is, is really valuable to an organization. All right, so why does this all matter? Why does it having a, a, a good picture of your data, um, using it proactively, why does it all matter? And I will tell you that, you know, from an insurance company perspective, we have a commercial auto liability insurance challenge. Um, nuclear verdicts are on the rise. Um, we just, unfortunately, uh, were handed the, uh, our first billion dollar verdict uh, a couple months back uh, out of Florida. Um, and we're seeing that happen more and more often. Social inflation is real. Uh, we have, a, like I, as I mentioned, a, an insurance challenge. 2020 uh, was the 10th consecutive year that the commercial auto liability insurance um, space lost money, had a combined ratio or an operating ratio north of 100. Um, and every insurer in the space, and we fared better than most, uh, but every insurer in the space is, is trying to figure out how do we improve results um, and, and doing that through uh, increased rate, improved safety technology. Um, some have gotten out of the market altogether, uh, taking a look at their underwriting practices. Uh, all those things are really um, methods to tackle the challenge. Uh, but, you know, is it going to be enough? And we think that you know, in addition to some of those things, the use of data and technology, and as Kate mentioned earlier, feeding that back to um, our fleets uh, can have an impact. So the folks that really understand their um, profile have an opportunity to really um, put themselves in a competitive advantage, right? We believe that insurance is ripe for disruption. Uh, so just like Billy Baldi Podesta's Moneyball and the A's, um, you know, we're trying to figure out how we take that data, weaponize it, feed it back, make it actionable, and deliver some powerful insight. So, you know, from our perspective, moving insurance from a, a grudge purchase uh, to something that is is more meaningful and more powerful and, and delivers you real results. So. Um, you know, 
now it is more important than ever to really understand your profile to control your risk in case can add a few points to this. Uh, yep. And before I jump in, Josh, we had a question come in. Sure. Um, with telematics becoming more and more accessible and affordable, how does an insurance company feel about a company who isn't capitalizing on the data? Great question. Um, you know, I, I do believe that telematics data is sort of the next frontier. Um, you know, it, it's the it, it's the AERs, the automated event recorders of 10 years ago, uh, maybe even 15 years ago. People who had automated event recorders 15 years ago were ahead of the game. They were ahead of the curve. Um, nowadays, I, there aren't many fleets, and, and I should say there aren't many best-in-class fleets that do not have um, an automated event recorder solution. Uh, because again, there are more and more out there and it's giving you the whole picture. Um, so I do believe that telematics and the use of telematics um, is, is sort of the next frontier. And, you know, it, if you really think about it, it's been in the personal line space for a number of years now. Um, Progressive really started it with their snapshot. Um, and they found that actually folks that were willing to put that little chip in their car and give the data to Progressive were more apt to be better drivers anyway. Just signing up for the program um, gave you an automatic discount because you now were um, willing to share the data, right? And uh, I don't know about anyone else on the call, but I've uh, my insurance company right now has a I've got an app on my phone that tracks my speed, uh, hard braking, harsh cornering, uh, phone distraction um, every time I drive, and. I check my score all the time to make sure that it's not falling below where uh, it, I want it to be so that I can continue to get my discount. So it really is, you know, I do believe again that it's sort of the next frontier uh, when it comes to a technology solution. Um, and it provides so much more data. As Kate mentioned, it's not just the breadcrumbs, it's the, you're getting the full view um, of what's going on. Josh, I'm going to kind of tune in here a little bit. So without telematics, insurance carriers are forced to look at the FMCSA data, which is all based on 24 months of previous history or the CAB report. Speak a little bit, if you would, about how insurance carriers like National Interstate are using that data, especially when there's no other available information to work off of. Yeah, sure. So that's a big part of our uh underwriting process. Um, we're, we're looking at that. We actually use each of those um, CSA basic scores to really drive uh, a predictive model. Um, so with all of our fleets that we insure, um, we've thrown that up against the loss histories and really determined what, what scores have the most weight. Um, and, and, and when um, a score is, is over the threshold or in alert status, we apply more of a debit uh, to to the risk. But again, Jordan, as you mentioned, that is mostly reactive. Uh, we're trying to get to um, proactive, predictive solutions. Um, and, you know, these technologies, they don't take hold overnight, but we know that they do have an impact. So someone who put in uh, automated event recorders a year ago, but it's probably now fully up to speed and starting to see the benefits of it. And and we would expect that frequency of loss, severity of loss, um, you know, is going to drive down over time as they continue to uh, implement those those uh, technologies. So, you know, it's it's again moving from reactive solutions to proactive solutions to try to get a better picture um, of of the of the organization as a whole. You know, I'll just add on to that a little bit further. If as a motor carrier, you're not looking at your CSA scores and cab report and your partner broker or insurance carrier isn't collaborating to get the story behind that data, uh, you're at a disadvantage because oftentimes the the driver that received those violations or that warning, uh, you've done coaching with them, you've you've done something to try and help them improve or her improve, or maybe you dismiss that driver completely, but without that backstory, Josh and his team are, or any other insurance carrier, they're trying to guess based off past data without the true full story.
Right, and, and to Josh's point earlier, keep in mind when we're looking at your profile as a fleet owner, we are looking at CSA scores and loss runs, all of these things that are actually results of the bigger picture. So without really leveraging this data and knowing, you know, are you maintaining an accident register and, you know, in addition, a near miss accident register? Probably not, we encourage it. You know, it really helps you track and trend what's happening in your fleet. But a lot of what creates your profile to an insurance company today is a series of outcomes. And by not leveraging the data internally and understanding what your actual risks are, you're not able to control those outcomes. So you really do need to, you know, from an insurance company perspective, from a risk management perspective, if you don't, if you're not taking advantage of that to control your losses and overall what you look like from a risk profile, um, it's a big misstep. You're missing a lot of uh, opportunity to control your the dollars in your pocket, and you know what your overall risk factors are. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not only knowing your profile, but being able to uh, convey that um, you know with with your broker and and within your organization uh, to a carrier. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big it's a big opportunity, um, and you know. I had mentioned that we've got an insurance challenge, a commercial liability insurance challenge. And, and you can view that as a problem or you can view it as an opportunity. You know, every problem uh, is an opportunity in disguise. The fleets that use technology to proactively manage their risk, their exposure, um, are going to give themselves a competitive advantage against their, uh, their competitors that, that aren't doing this, right? And, you combine um, that data-driven safety culture with an intelligent risk financing solution, shameless plug for National Interstate, we do uh, you know, a, a number of alternative risk transfer programs where we uh, participate in the risk with our insurers or our insurers participate in the risk with us. Um, and as a result of their performance, they have the opportunity to get some dollars back if they don't use them. So those who, you know, again, are best in class, proactively managing, reducing their, um, their risk exposure should be uh, taking on some potential risk in order to ultimately drive down their costs. Insurance is, you know, likely your third or fourth largest expense and any dollars that you can save um, on that cost, on that expense, is you know going to go right to the bottom line and and that's where you know looking at alternative risk financing or, or intelligent risk financing uh, solutions uh, really can give you a competitive advantage think of it about a, a similar to um you know a fuel surcharge if you are getting more uh, miles per gallon than your competitor and the fuel sur surcharge goes up fine great you're you're in better shape because you are able to better uh, operate or, or more efficiently operate your fleet than somebody else. And, and that's really what, you know, uh, selecting a, a risk financing solution uh, could do for you. So uh, again, you know, just to kind of re reiterate, you can separate yourself, um, you know, get your house in order, drive a top down safety culture, a data driven safety culture. Um, that is really going to uh, help set you apart from the operate from your, your your competitors and then combine that with an intelligent risk financing solution and you're going to give yourself um, a, a cost of risk leverage advantage um, meaning that you know if you can drive some uh, returns from your insurance premium uh, that's again going to go straight to the bottom line so um, you know we appreciate uh, the time today to, to speak to you all about some of the things that we uh, see going on with data and fleets um, and and in the insurance industry um, and uh, we're certainly open to any questions at this point um, and we thank you for those who uh, submitted some throughout the presentation well josh and kate thank you again for taking some time from your schedules to visit with us this morning a lot of valuable content and as you think about and digest this information over the next few days uh, feel free and reach out with questions. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts in the transportation space and uh, National Interstate and here at OVD, we're here to come alongside you and, and help make you better today than you were yesterday and make or set you up to be a little bit better tomorrow than you are today. So 
we're going to take a, a quick uh, five minute break and we'll transition over to Matt Fabry and then we'll start at the top of the hour uh, with his portion of the presentation. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. Oh, and, and then Josh and Kate will stick around for Q&A afterwards as well. Absolutely, yep. Hey, Jordan, I think you have to allow me to share whenever you get a chance. Working on that now. Okay, all right, no problem. Okay, looks like, yep. Yeah. Well, it's 10 o'clock, so we're going to keep things rolling. Uh, again, we want to thank Josh and Kate for their portion of the presentation. And now we have the privilege of listening to Matt Fabry from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Um, we've had him at a few of our other summits, and we're appreciative that he took some time to be involved in this year's Transportation Summit. So we'll turn it over to Matt. Okay, thank you very much. Um, glad to be a part of this again. Um, and uh, just one thing before I kind of get rolling. Um, some of the things that uh, Kate and Josh touched on are um, really fantastic ways of, um, you know, preventing, preventing that phone call of, hey, there's an accident, preventing that phone call, my driver's placed out of service for this or that, or an injury, whatever it may be. Um, it's something that the FMCSA, the USDOT always promotes as being proactive. I think I heard Kate and Josh say that word a couple of times. Be proactive, let's not be reactive. Um, we, we tell companies this all the time, being reactive usually means um, that something caught someone's attention. Um, and usually in the uh, trucking industry, as you all know, catching someone's attention is not always a great thing. It's usually never a great thing. Um, you don't hear, oh, you, these driver, this driver's so great, let's call the company up and tell them, let them know. Usually it's something the other way and it causes you to react. Um, so take advantage of all those systems and be proactive um, when it comes to safety. Um, it really helps in the long run. Um, so just to start off, uh, I'd like to just touch on a little um, about the makeup of the enforcement staff uh, within the state of Michigan. Um, as you probably all know, there's at least one FMCSA division uh, throughout um, in every state throughout the United States, some states have more. Um, 
and all FMCSA offices work hand in hand with their counterparts, which would be the uh, motor carrier officers within that state. Um, here in Michigan, we have uh, six investigators with the FMCSA. Um, there's two managers, one being myself. Uh, we have a program analyst that assists um, pretty all facets of our office. And then we have one uh, division administrator who oversee, who's, who's pretty really our supervisor. Um, and then the Michigan State Police Traffic Safety Division, uh, many of you might know it as the uh, Motor Carrier Division. It's what it used to be called. It's still referred to as that many times, but um, that, that's made up as 11, of 11 investigators throughout the state. They have 100 motor carrier officers that are patrolling the road, 31 sergeants, nine lieutenants, and three auditors. Uh, the auditors would be those uh, that, you know, when, when companies come into the industry, when they obtain a US DOT number, they are doing what we call as the new entrant safety audits. I'm sure many of you are aware of that. Um, and together, the FMCSA and the Michigan State Police, and then across the country in each, in each state, we really do work hand in hand. Um, what they do, drives a lot of what we do. Um, what we do, you know, sometimes can drive what they do. What I mean by that is when motor carrier officers for the state are stopping uh, stopping trucks on the, on the side of the road or involved in crash investigations, whatever it may be, all of their information is input into a system uploaded into the federal uh, database and as you are all pretty much aware, it develops a score or an, S an SMS score um, or a percentage for your guys' basics that then we monitor on a regular basis. And that's how we kind of make a decision on whether or not, hey, maybe we should go take a look at this company. Um, maybe there's something going on here. So everything they do on the roadside um, impacts what we um, may do as far as when we come into a company. Sometimes when we go into a company, we may see something, you know, so abnormal as far as uh, maintenance or anything like that. We put on a be on the lookout to our counterparts at the state. Hey, watch out for these vehicles. They, they, they're trying to fix stuff or they said they're fixing stuff, but uh, we don't believe it. So watch it, watch it going down the road. Just take a look at it. We want to see if anything's being corrected. Um, so that's how we kind of work hand in hand. Um, FMCSA and the state both alike. We we do um, investigations. We do on-site, off-site. We do cargo tank facility reviews. Um, the FMCSA does do roadside inspections. Um, the Michigan State Police makes up the majority of those by far. Um, and then we also all you know will come in and do investigations on companies based on complaints, based on strike forces or significant crashes. Um, then we we'll, we will go into a company ourselves or the state police will do that um, pretty much on a regular basis. Um, right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, unfortunately, things have changed. Um, so I thought this is just something important to reach out or just to let you guys know about what's going on. Um, right now, we are really concentrating heavily um, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic on offsite investigations. Um, and how that how that works is, is an investigator for our from um, the FMCSA staff or the uh, Michigan State Police, um, they'd reach out to you by a phone call at first, um, and then they'd start by contacting you, or, or excuse me, after they they made the phone call, they would um, email you a letter. They you know confirm who who you want the email to go to, and then they're going to email you an opening letter with just basic company information, requesting basic company information, um, letting you know who they are and um, just everything about how the process is going to start. After that opening letter, there will now then be a follow-up email with specific requests for certain documents. And then that would open up a section within your guys' portal. And um, hopefully most of you guys are aware of, of logging into the FMCSA portal. And that, that's how you would upload your documents. And that's how it would start the entire um, off-site process. Um, this has been going on, you know, since uh, March, you know, last March, um, or yeah, it's in March of, of 2020. Um, so this is, and it's going to continue to go on right now. It's not just a COVID thing, but it was very heavy, heavy during COVID. So um, 
so if someone reaches out to you guys, you know, for an offsite review, asks you to start, you know, emailing stuff in or uploading documents, it is not a third party. Uh, we do get those call calls or questions all the time. This is a lot how the Michigan State Police and the FMCSA are handling things right now. Um, and what really makes it work well um, is good communication. First, it's got to start on our side, and we do we 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 tell our investigators that you have to let them know what's going on. You, you guys aren't going to just start uploading documents, you know, unless they really, you guys really know what's going on. So we need to communicate with you guys what's going on. You need to communicate back with us if you're having issues with any kind of upload of documents or if you just have any questions in general. And then, like I said, as um, the process really starts beginning when you upload documents um, and then we would take a look at what we need and then just be in constant communication with you throughout the offsite investigation. Um, and back up to the top real quick for what I mean by CR, um, it, that stands for compliance review. You would, you would hear it called compliance review, compliance investigation, or a lot of people refer to it just as an audit. Um, but that's that's what I mean by that. Um, and then lastly, the offsite review works so well because it really reduces any any of your guys' delays. Um, whoever's been through a on-site investigation knows, um, you know, when myself when I did the investigations or one of our investigators when we come in, sit down with you, you know, it really takes full almost 100% participation. Um, where the offsites, you can upload stuff after work, you can upload stuff early in the morning, you can kind of do it at your own pace. Um, and then the FMCSA right now, our office right now is currently doing 100% offsites, or I should say 99% offsites. We can go on if something is really not working out well, um, we can go on site to a company, but the FMCS, or excuse me, the Michigan State Police is full blown doing um, on and off sites. They are not restricted at all currently. Um, with every um, presentation that I've ever done, um, I have to, well, at least for about the last, I would say 10 years, I, I always want to, and the, when I was going through this one, I wasn't real sure. I said, I didn't see a good spot to put it in, but I mean, I said, yeah, I got to touch base on electronic logs. Um, this is something you guys have been hearing about for the last, uh, yeah, I would say 10 years, but it's something that's full blown in effect right now. So I just wanted to throw out a couple reminders about the electronic logs um, for all of you um, to make sure you're doing or just to jog your memory. Um, so one thing um, that we see um, you know, real often in the electronic, electronic logging world is the falsification of an electronic log. Um, a falsification of log books has been going on forever. Many motor carriers thought that that would be eliminated when when the um, ELD rule came out. So obviously the true or false here is obviously um, a false, a driver can can absolutely falsify um, a ELD. And some of the ways they would falsify and some of the ways I wanna bring to your guys' attention just to make sure you're checking um, in your back office systems with your electronic or with your ELD vendor is you need to be checking for drivers that are unplugging the device. And again, these are some of the, the these are the most frequent ways that we find log falsification in a company that we go into. Um, we see unassigned driving miles. We see fictitious drivers or what you'd call a ghost driver. Um, and then we see um, also we see drivers operating, um, you are misusing PC or personal conveyance as you, you know, you know that's the technical term. Um, this truly is supposed to be an off duty status. It's really a personal trip. So when you guys are checking your driver's logs, we need to be checking to make sure that a driver, when um, when they go off duty in Knoxville, Tennessee, they don't come on duty the next day in Indianapolis, Indiana, or something, you know, city, some other city down the road. That is very common to what we see, but also it's very surprising because if you're being proactive and you're checking your ELD back office, it's something that you can find very easily. Um, you can see the unassigned driving. You can see that the truck is moving. So that's something you want to be watching. And then also, if you guys do allow personal conveyance, because it is allowed, you want to monitor that. And you want to have an internal policy in place. Um, we do not have a policy. We, we have some guidelines, but we don't have a, a FMCSA does not really have much of a policy as how many miles they can go. They just, you know, they just say it has to be a personal trip, has to be truly off duty. Um, it can't be in used, it can't be used to enhance uh, operational readiness. 
Um, you can't combine personal, you know, trip with business. Basically, you can't be driving down the road, um, going to visit a cousin, but you're moving four hours closer to your delivery for the next day. This is all something just to remind you guys, um, just to go ahead and make sure you're monitoring these driver's logs. And these are the ones, the biggest things that stick out when we go into a company, when we, when we check for hours of service. Um, as you guys all know, the hours of serve, the new hours of service, keeping along on this subject, um, went into effect September 29th of 2020. So we are, uh, you know, a little over a year ago. Um, there was some changes made to the hours of service, um, in the, and they weren't, we didn't add additional time or anything like that, but, um, we just modified four separate parts and we'll just touch on that real briefly here. So, 1st, the short haul exception. Um, so, CDL property and passenger drivers, they're currently granted exceptions. For short haul operations, um, when we, so when you're operating the short haul exception, you're not required to maintain on um, the record of duty status. So you don't need to have an ELD or you don't need that graph grid. And you're also not, you don't need to take your 30 minute break when you run under the short haul exception. Um, as you guys know, drivers that are running with a log, and I'll touch on that in a second, or need a log, you do need to take that 30 minute break within eight hours of being on duty. So short haul, you do not need to do that. Um, the FMCSA, the biggest thing they changed here is we modified, um, we modified the rule to, to drive so drivers can operate within a 150 mile radius where it used to be the 100 air mile radius and we uh, expanded it to a 14 hour work shift um, instead of the 12 hour that was under the previous rule so 150 air mile radius has always been the case for a non cdl driver but we now um, modified that to make it you know uniform so it's a little easier so remember the 14 hour work shift and now it's a 150 air mile radius um, all around whether you're cdl or non cdl and then there's the adverse driving conditions definition. Um, so it extends the duty day basically by two hours. So the adverse driving exception can only be applied if the condition was unforeseeable immediately prior to driving or dispatch. Um, so drivers that you know just that uh, just come up to a situation. Whether it, you know, if you're driving and all of a sudden you hit a snowstorm, that would be a good use of the um, adverse driving conditions. Um, but however, if you're driving up into northern Maine in February and the, they're calling for a, a, a huge storm to hit, and everyone knows it's coming, and you drive up there and you try to use it, that's not that's not going to be a good use of adverse driving conditions. Um, if you're driving into New York City at five o'clock in the afternoon um, and well, it's New York City, uh, so you know that there's going to be traffic. You cannot use adverse driving conditions. So stuff like that is not adverse driving conditions. Um, but however, you if you come into a you know an area that is just not the norm, if you're out in Montana, there's a major accident. You have to get off the road, um, and you want to let the road clear. There's a lo there's logs that spilled all over. You can now use that as adverse driving conditions. I just touched on this a little bit um, right here. Um, so accidents, and this is a little more here, accidents involving a drive, the driver would not be adverse driving conditions. Breakdowns would not be um, adverse driving conditions. Um, road construction or detours would not be unless the driver could not have reasonably known about the construction or detour. The, the last one here, um, I would say is a little tough, you know, to prove one way or the other. Let's just use common sense. If we're in a company and someone's using adverse driving conditions and um, something comes up like this, I mean, we're, it's not going to be able to be proven whether or not they knew about the construction or not. But if you're taking a regular route and you know that highway has been closed all summer long, and, you know, because, because they're doing whatever they're doing, um, and then you try to use adverse driving conditions, um, that's not going to work. So um, a lot of this is like with, um, a lot of the regulations, we got to use common sense, um, especially with adverse driving conditions with personal conveyance. Um, take a look at what your drivers are doing and um, try to make a decision. Is it regularly occurring? Um, if not, it's probably it probably is good use of it. 
And then the um, 30 minute break requirement. Um, so FMCSA changed the 30 minute break requirement by making the requirement applicable um, only to when a driver has driven instead of just being on duty. If you guys recall, you used to have to be on, or excuse me, even if you were on duty, you had to take a 30 minute break. If you're on duty for eight hours, um, even if part of it was loading, whatever it may be, not just driving, but you still had to take a break for 30 minutes. Well, now you can be, you can take your um, 30 minute break um, when you're on duty, not driving. You can use it off duty, obviously. You can use it in your sleep or birth, or you can use it in a mix. So that's something we changed too. If only if you're driving for eight straight hours, do you need to take that 30 minute break? And here's just the summary of that right there. Like I just said, you can combine it with however you want to use it. If you're loading, if you're getting your log book ready, if you're doing your pre trip inspection on duty, any kind of on duty not driving uh, can now be your 30 minute break. And then last change that took place here is the uh, sleep or birth provision. Um, so we now allow a driver uh, the flexibility in taking two off duty periods under the sleep or birth provision. Um, one period though must be at least seven hours, uh, seven consecutive hours spent in the sleep or birth. And then it must be paired with another period of at least two hours spent either in the sleep or birth or otherwise off duty. Um, or with team drivers up to three hours, you can be in a passenger seat of a moving commercial vehicle to achieve that pair. Um, as long as the two periods remember, and this has always been the case, we have to achieve a total of 10 hours. So when paired together, um, neither qualifying period would work against your 14 hour driving window. Now, um, remember these are minimum requirements here. So um, either rest period can be longer as long as they're paired, you know, in the total break, um, the total break must be 10 hours and neither would work or none of it would work against your 14 hour window. And then the, uh, the doc, you might hear it, you know, the, the government is all big on um, acronyms, but you'll hear doc, you'll hear all kinds of um, different acronyms here, but, uh, I should have taken this out here and put the right one, but now this is the drug and alcohol uh, clearing house. You guys are all probably well aware of this. Well, hopefully you are. If you're not, you need to be aware of it if you have uh, CDL drivers. <clears throat> so the drug and alcohol testing clearing house, um, was something was mandated by, uh, by Congress in 2016. It was part of the MAP 21 law. It was, it was signed in by the Obama administration. Um, it was published, as I said, in 2016, and it was implemented in January of 2020. Um, if you do need extra information on it, there is the website here. Uh, you can go on to our, the FMCSA's website, you Google it, it's all over the place. Um, everything about the drug and alcohol testing clearinghouse. It is full effect now, it is rolling. Um, we are coming up um, on two years now, so um, hopefully you guys are well aware of this. Some drug and alcohol testing clearinghouse stats here. Currently, we have um, 1.9 million drivers registered. Uh, 237, about 237,000 or almost 238,000 employers registered or companies. 60, almost 62,000 positive tests uh, reported to the clearinghouse. And then we also have of 57, 50, almost 58,000 drivers that are prohibited in the clearing house. Um, when I said earlier about like strike forces that the FMCSA or the Michigan State Police might do, um, right now, and it's no surprise, we're 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 doing um, we're doing something where we're looking in the clearing house because we have access to all this data, and and believe me, there's tons we could we could have um, ten different people do full time jobs of just tracking down positive drivers, but. We're contacting employers who have inspections, who have drivers that are, were prohibited while they were inspected. So this is something that you guys need to be monitoring too. And one, you need for, to start, you need to be registered. I will touch on that in a second here, but you need to be registered with the drug and alcohol testing clearinghouse because there's drivers out there that are uh, 
that are operating vehicles every day. I mean, there's tons of them that are operating that are prohibited and motor carriers one ran did run a query or two they didn't run a query and if they ran a query that's a big issue you didn't pull the driver off the road you still hired the driver and they're now running and then they're inspected so um, that's something that you guys need to be checking on a regular basis um, a lot of times um, unfortunately drivers will even be inspected and they won't even be cited for whatever reason sometimes it's a it's a, a, a connection issue where the where the officer didn't notice that the driver was prohibited. However, if that inspection is uploaded into our system, we have a cross reference, and the drug and alcohol testing clearinghouse will catch it and see that hey, uh, Bob Smith Trucking out of Lansing, Michigan, received an inspection while Jane Doe was prohibited, and then it sends a flag into our system. That is one other another thing that you guys need to be um, proactive about and monitoring and checking it all the time. Um, so, based on, uh, based on the type of query that you guys run, um, there's different consent that's required. So, you see here with this graph here, um, if you're doing an annual query, which is required to be done annually, um, obviously, you just do a limited query. So, you just need general consent. It's done outside the clearinghouse. Um, you can get it from a, you can make up a document, you can make up your own document, or you can go on the clearinghouse uh, website and there is a uh, there is one for a template for you guys to use um you can have a limited consent or you can have that you can you can you can make this consent be uh you know for as long as they're employed however you guys want to do it you just need to have it on file but there's also the pre-employment query when you guys hire a new driver um, you need to do a full query that is the query where you're going to actually need specific consent within the clearinghouse um, it's required and it's required to be done in the clearinghouse. And another requirement is each driver that you do a full query on needs to be registered with the clearinghouse. So that's something different um, from the annual query. Um, you just need, when they do a full query, they would have to be registered in the clearinghouse. And uh, so that's another step. When you guys hire a driver, you're gonna have to go ahead and do that um, every time. Um, and then another thing about a full query is, I meant to touch on this, but if you guys run a limited query and you get a hit, and meaning like you get a hit that Jane Doe is in the clearinghouse, you're gonna, and, and they're not in the clearinghouse because they have a clean record, but you're going to now have to do a full query. So then you're going to have ask for uh, consent within the clearinghouse to run Jane Doe's full query to figure out really what's going on. So some of the issues, and we're still seeing them, we're seeing less issues now, but some of the issues are um, that when registering with the clearinghouse, we're, we're signing up for the incorrect role. Um, uh, that would be, re they register as a consortium or a third party administrator. Um, and then you can't designate a, a third party administrator. You can't even purchase a query plan. Um, so you need to register properly. You need to register as an employer. Um, it also, if you write, if the employer registers as an assistant and not as admin, um, you can't, de you can't, again, you can't designate a third party administrator. You can't invite assistance to help you within your company. Um, and then lastly, the employer is registered as a driver. That would not, be another issue. Um, there's a lot of on our website on the drug and alcohol testing clearing out. So there's a bunch of frequently asked questions. There's a, there's a lot of problem solving um, issues on there. Um, because this has been happening and it's still happening, unfortunately, but it's something um, if you go to the website, you could probably figure out. Hopefully you guys are all registered now, but these are some of the regular um, issues that we're seeing with the clearinghouse. Okay, moving on to the um, entry level driver training. This is something right here that is coming. Um, it's coming hot. Hot and quick. So um, uh, this is the topic that hopefully you guys are well aware of. Um, this is um, was published in 2016 and, and mandated by the MAP 21 again um, during the President Obama administration. So we're, this is something that is definitely in law now. Um, so starting um, February 7th of 2022, um, every a driver that obtains a CDL or or upgrades um, in 
touch more specifically on that in a minute, will be required to the ELDT rule. ELDT rule is um, part 380 of the federal regulations. Um, so the FMCSA actually took a negotiated rulemaking, and there's a lot to this, so pardon me for really sticking to my notes here, but um, I'll be glad to answer any questions um, at the end about this. But So we took a negotiated rulemaking to ensure that all impacted parties um, were able to participate in the rulemaking process. Um, so it was not just the FMCSA setting it up, it's with the states, it's with the pro training providers, everyone put the rule really together. Um, the final rule was amended in March of 2019 to include new class A theory instruction um, upgrade curriculum. So this was intended to reduce training time um, and costs incurred by any class B CDL holder upgrading to a class A CDL. We see that actually commonly. Um, in March of 2020, we extended this rule to the compliance date that we're coming, coming to right now of February 7th of uh, 2022. And right now um, we're in you know October, uh, that's coming up four months-ish away. I don't see, and I've been told there's nothing that's going to extend this again. So um, please, you know, operate as is. But that being said, it could look like a fool in one week, one week, week, one month. This could be extended, but nothing has. There's nothing that shows this has been extended a couple times. It's been modified. There's nothing that shows that this ELDT uh, rule, the entry level driver train, is going to be um, extended at all. The longer combination vehicle training requirements are currently in Part 380. Um, those have been in there. Those remain in effect even when, after ELDT is in place. This is not taking over the um, longer combination vehicle training. Um, so make sure you're well aware of that. So in general, there's two elements. There's the theory training, and then there's the behind the wheel training. Um, the theory training uses lectures or demonstrations to convey the concepts and theories of safe vehicle operations. So the goal is that it will establish foundation of knowledge a CMV operator needs to have when they start to actually drive the vehicle. Um, the appendices in 380, they go into really great detail about the requirements for each section. So for an example, the safety belt section, and it's it just says, this unit must teach driver trainees the federal rules for governing the proper use of a safety restraint system by CMV drivers as set forth in 392.16. So it doesn't dictate like how the provider needs to meet the requirement, but it's just saying in it that you, it requires you that the topic exists and that the, the driver applicant shows proficiency with that matter. But it's not telling you, you know, exactly how you need to do that. Um, theory training, it can be in person, it can be virtual, um, it can even be in a training simulator. Um, there's no minimum number of hours, but the trainees who must take an assessment at the end. And we, we say that they just must score at least an 80% of the, during that theory training. Um, now, behind the, for behind the wheel training, there's two elements. Um, there's range training, then there's road training. Um, it must be in person and it must be, you know, it must be in a real CMV. Now there's no simulator and, and no simulator can be involved in this on the behind the wheel training. Um, there's no minimum of hours required. Um, but the training provider must actually log how many hours are how many hours they went through. So that's something that the training provider can determine of how many you know behind the wheel hours will be required. Um, the experience must be a representative vehicle for the specific curriculum. So basically, if a driver is trying to get a CDL in a class, or excuse me, trying to get a class A CDL, they can't be using a class B vehicle, can't be using a class C vehicle. If I'm using trying to drive a tractor trailer, I want a class A CDL, I need to use the uh, exact same vehicle as what I would be using when I get my CDL when I start you know, operating in commerce. Um, and then there is some schools that do group training um, for when it comes to behind the wheel. So, um, the observation of a, of controlling a vehicle is not actual, you know, proficient uh, showing proficiency of controlling a vehicle. And what I mean by that is um, simply being in the cab of, ve of a vehicle when a, when they're doing group training. There can be students that sit in the back when this is taking place, 
but actually observing the training or actually observing the control of this vehicle is not really showing displaying proficiency so that wouldn't work for that or it wouldn't work for the applicant that's sitting in the sleeper berth or wherever they are in that vehicle so keep that in mind um, and that applies to both range and road training Matt, we had a question come in sure okay any thoughts to the potential of lowering the minimum age requirements for interstate driving to 18 years of age? So I can, that, that's a great question. And there is something on that. And there's a, there's a study taking place right now. And I, off the top of my head, I want to say it's something to do with, um, I think it's veterans that are 18 or under 21 over 18 or over. That are doing there is a pool of them right now that's going on so that, that yes that is being considered i'd be glad to share what i have on that um if, at the end i'll provide my email but i'll, I'll give you the information that is definitely being considered right now and i believe there is a study taking place currently Lori. so for the um the eld the eldt continuing on um the regulations apply for individuals applying for the following um if they're obtaining a class A or a class B CDL for the first time, or if they're upgrading. So if, they're, if, a, if a driver has a class B CDL and they want to change to a class A, this would, the ELDT rule would, would be, um, they would not, you know, they would have to follow the, whatever the rules say. Um, or if you're attaining either hazardous materials, a passenger carrier, or a school bus endorsement for the first time. Um, and keep in mind the CDL part 383 in general, this is for intrastate or interstate. Um, we're not going to start talking about the different regulations and what applies to what right now, but CDL, it does not matter if you're interstate or intrastate, um, the CDL applies to you. Simply putting a K restriction on your CDL, which would be the intrastate only, does not waive any requirement for the ELDT uh, rule. Um, there's no requirements now for Class C CDLs. Um, we say that you guys are going to get sufficient training um, for passenger or school bus training or the HM endorsement training while you're working on getting that actual endorsement. So that would that way the ELDT would not apply to any um, class C CDL holders or when you, if you're trying to get the class C CDL. Um, for A or excuse me for the B to uh, A upgrade, um, there is a modified curriculum. So it's not at you don't have to go through as much. Um, there, it removes eight non-driving activity topics um, that basically someone holding the Class B CDL um, would still presumably have a lot of familiarity with. So there is a little difference when you're upgrading from a B to an A um, and what rules pertains to you. Now I'm throwing a lot of a lot of this stuff at you guys. But it's just it's a lot of information, but it's something that's coming, like I said, hot and quick right now. Um, but your training provider, if you guys go to a registered training provider, and I'll get to that here in a second, they're going to be responsible for a majority of this. But it's just something you as a motor carrier, again, um, going back to that word of being proactive, just want to be aware of um, what you're, uh, you know, if you're, if you have someone going to a tr to um, obtain their CDL, um, just make sure that they're going and receiving the right training. Um, and then lastly, there's no exception for any you know, CDL holders with the ELDT rule. If you're getting a CDL um, after fe this February 7th of 2022, if you're a farm hauler or if you're, you know, ag, the ag exempts out there, whatever you may be, if you need a CDL today, you need, you're, you're, you're not exempt, you're, the, you're subject to the ELDT rules. You're subject to the entry level driver training rules. Um, if you need a CDL, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Okay, so keep that in mind also. Um, one and then one uh, last thing that is very important here about the uh, about the ma the magic date of February seventh of two thousand twenty two. If you if you have a driver that obtains a CLP a commercial learner's permit prior to the implementation date of the February seventh, and as long as they're CLP, as long as their permit does not expire in Michigan, our permits last six months, or you can renew it if you're not feeling comfortable, you know, with taking the skills test. But as long as it does not expire um, and you obtain it before that magic February date, 
you are not subject to the entry level driver training rules. So keep that in mind too. Um, if, as long as someone's obtaining it, if someone is thinking about it, obtaining it right now, I mean, I would say go ahead and obtain, start trying to do it right now if they're comfortable. Um, it could make life a lot easier for them. So just keep that in mind as long as it does not expire, but they obtain it prior to that magic date, they're not subject um, to the rules. And then here's the uh, in, the uh, training, as I indicated before, the training provider registry. Um, the FMCSA system, it lists uh, uh, eligible training providers. Um, it retains a completion of, of record, uh, retain a, it retains a completion, excuse me, of drivers that have obtained it and went through, um, went through and got their CDLs. Um, so if you guys go to our website, you can, you know, you can find an area that you're in if you have drivers that are they're going to um, want to become CDL drivers or want to upgrade. Um, it is all listed on our website. And the training part provider requirements here. Um, you can see there is a lot of um, there, there's a lot that they have to uh, submit to the FMCSA. They have to agree to all this and self certify to become registered and to get on the, tr the training pr provider registry. Um, so they have to, you know, they have to register. They have, they have to, I won't go through all that right here, but this is everything that they have to make sure they're doing um, to become on the to get on the FMCSA. You'll see a TPR, another acumen, or the training provider registry. Um, if you go to our website, you can find um, companies that are are registered, um, are self certified to become a training provider um, in your area. Okay, so some things that are coming on over the horizon coming up here with the FMCSA, it's kind of been coming down uh, the road for five years or so. Um, with the met is the medical cert intrigate intrigate intrigation rule. Boy, Kate and Josh had someone to to take it to, to pass it off to. And I'm struggling here too. <laughs> so, um, but what's coming? Um, what's coming along? You know, down the road right now. Um, Currently, what we have there is the top part. You guys are all hopefully should be well aware of the medical examiner certification and how the whole process works, but just something briefly, uh, you know, just to, uh, this is kind of a little chart just to, to explain it. So right now, the medical examiner um, examines the driver and then the driver, excuse me, medical examiner examines the driver. The medical examiner does submit information to the FMCSA. And then the driver takes the medical and has to take it themselves to the SDLA. That would be the State Driver's License Agency. So the Michigan Secretary of State here. That's currently what happens. Um, that was, you know, supposed to be changed here um, a couple, of, I think it was a year ago, a little over a year ago when we pushed it out again. So now what's happening or supposed to happen June 23rd of 2025, um, the medical examiner will examine the driver. The medical examiner sends it right to the FMCSA. The FMCSA then sends it to the Michigan Secretary of State. So currently the driver is responsible when the medical is completed to take it to the uh, Michigan Secretary of State. I can't tell you, I can't, can't even count. We go for probably once a month at least, a company that we, we can visit, um, that a driver does not take it to the Secretary of State doesn't take it to the Secretary of State for they, they forget and it, and it goes and just falls by the hindsight for so long that the driver's CDL gets downgraded. The state of Michigan will give you 60 days before they'll downgrade a CDL for not upgrading your CDL in the system. Um, that is another thing that a motor carrier has to be proactive about. We see, I would say 75% of the carriers that we see with drivers that are downgraded, um, the motor carrier actually has their their driver rec, driving record or MVR on file that shows the expiration date that happened four months ago, and they don't run it again. They just weren't proactive. They the driver they fell just fell through the cracks. Well, the driver usually gets stopped, or we come into the company, and then that's where problems happen. Um, so you have to make sure you guys stay on top of that one. And be proactive and whatever, however, maybe you guys need to do that. Um, so 
pay attention to those um, medical expiration dates because in Michigan, 60 days after the expiration, they, they, it will be, they will lose their CDL privileges. Oh, and then the last little comment there. So motor carrier, um, the motor carrier must maintain and does, they, 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 this is where they need to maintain it, the a copy of the MVR currently um, showing that they have their, a copy of their current MVR, excuse me, showing their medical status as certified. So you guys do not need to, and um, ho just holding a medical card um, in your driver qualification file you know, that is not good enough anymore for showing that you have a qualified or medically certified driver. You do need to have the current um, driver driver status or MVR in hand on file at all times that shows your medical, your, your driver is medically, you know, certified. Okay. So that's something you guys do need to order when your driver takes it to the SDLA. And with that, Jordan, there's my information there. Um, there's a lot of information I threw at you there. And just lastly, um, if there's questions about anything I touched on, I will be glad to answer it. But if there's other stuff, you can use me as a contact. Um, I think Jordan will attest. I try my best to get back to you pretty quick. Um, with any questions about the regulations, if I don't have an answer, I will certainly um, find someone that can get you an answer. And if you don't want to go directly to Matt and out yourself, just reach out to OVD and then we'll be the, the go between so that they, they don't connect the dots there. So I did have one question pop up for you, Matt. How would a motor carrier handle a, a driver who has a second non CDL type job when it comes to hours of service? Well, if, if I'm understanding that correctly, the, the, um, a driver, a not or a driver or a CDL driver or any driver doesn't, the CDL really doesn't come into play here. Um, that would be if they're getting compensated working at, let's say McDonald's, and then they come into work later that day, that is on duty, not driving. Okay. But that's Perfect. the question they would look and try to look for. Yep. They do need to account for those hours. I don't know if hopefully I answered that correctly. Perfect. And we had another question pop up. Is it legal for a carrier to update the SOS with the driver's new DOT card so the driver won't have to take time to do it themselves? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it is. They can do that online. Um, I, I'd like to ask this if I, this is the best way I wish we were in person. I'd like to ask this per, the, that carrier, have they been able to ever successfully do that? Because I'm if, if they can do that, I believe that I believe there is a way to do that. Something I'd have to look at, but I think you can okay. do that. So, so it is legal that, that their question was, is it legal? And it, yeah. it, it is legal. Okay, perfect. Yep. Yep. Very good. Yep. They said they do it all online all the time so okay perfect perfect well josh kate matt thank you guys very much on behalf of the team here at obd for taking some time to visit with us we certainly wish it would have been in person uh for those that attended the summit today you know as you think about all the information that you just took in over the past hour and 45 minutes or so there was a lot to take in and as you digest that over the next few days you know no doubt you you likely feel overwhelmed with all the things that you have on your plate and we spent a lot of time talking about going from, from a reactive perspective as a motor carrier to a proactive perspective. Uh, as you think through that, uh, feel free and reach out to the team here at OVD. We have resources and tools to really come alongside you and act as an extension of your HR and safety department, and then help tell that story to the insurance carriers like National Interstate so that you can be the best in class motor carrier and have less and less impact uh, from those around you that aren't operating to the level that you are. So. Thank you again, Josh, Kate, Matt, and uh, if, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. We'll get those passed on over the next few days. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon.